part three of the high tech telemetry series, we're going to discuss how to get the information from your sensor stations into your supported radios, such as the Aurora 9, the Optic 5 and 6, 2.4 gig support models, and also the Eclipse 7, as well as all the supported add on modules like the HTS Navi, the HTS Voice, the HTS iView, and also the HPP22 for real time streaming to the PC. So let's get started. All right, part three of the telemetry series is where we start talking about all the fun stuff, where we get all the data collected and returned back to us um, to the Aurora 9, and uh, also we have our HTS iView software, which works on iOS application or devices like an iPad or an iPhone or iPod Touch. And that's the module right here. We also have the HTS Navi interface, which works with the PC. We can stream our stuff down real time, store it, log it, view our uh, GPS activity on a map, and all that good stuff. And we also have HTS Voice, which is our voice announce module. It takes all of our uh, telemetry data from the radio it's connected to and announces it to us in intervals that we choose. We also choose what we want to set up or what we want to hear reported back to us, and also the, the alert thresholds. So let's get started with uh, the, probably the, the easiest way to do this if you've got the telemetry system uh, using the Aurora 9. I'm going to fire it up. I have a small sample sensor station set up. It's already connected, and uh, it'll give us the ability to see what some of the sensors do. So, um, working on the main screen, it's, it's pretty straightforward. In fact, uh, you've got the aircraft, the folder, and the wrench. Just click on the wrench, the settings. You have the sensor menu right there. You can go to sensor. There's a few different ways we can view this. Now, keep in mind that the Aurora 9 is going to display on its display what the uh, sensor station it's connected to is capable of doing. So if you hook up the Nitro uh, sensor station, you're going to get a different layout than if you hooked up the HTSS Blue for electrics. Likewise, if you hook up the uh, HTSS Advanced, which is what we have hooked up here, you're going to get some other options like Servo Manager and some other thing under the Advanced section. So we'll be able to take advantage of all the features, but it automatically adjusts for whatever sensor station you have hooked up. So let's start off by the GPS. Now we're indoors. The GPS is, uh, is going to pull some old data up. I am getting some sort of a signal. Um, uh, the altitude's wrong because I'm indoors now and I came in from outdoors. But what you'll see is a signal strength there underneath the little satellite dish. I'll show you what kind of signal strength the, the actual GPS unit is getting uh, from the satellite receivers or satellite, uh, um, uh, satellite GPS satellites in orbit. It'll give you your latitude, your longitude positioning, your altitude, and then of course your speed. Again, it's, it's airing out right now because I'm indoors. You can go into settings under GPS and you can choose the date, the actual unit from Imperial or metric. You can also shoot, uh, choose the altitude, either um, uh, ASL, which is uh, uh, absolute, which is above sea level, or you can do the uh, relative. And relative is whatever the altitude is. It sets it at zero or resets the altitude when you initialize the aircraft. And as you go through your flying for the day, it'll tell you relative to your current position how high up in the air you are, which is what you're going to use more often than not. Um, and it'll give you the time of the day as well. Um, if we go back to our, our view here, uh, we have RPM. I do have an RPM sensor hooked up to a motor. Now, to the RPM sensor, I have two available. Uh, I went ahead and plugged in just one, and I'm using the uh, magnetic RPM sensor, and I'm able to change the name of it there. So I called it motor because that's what I have hooked up to. Just rename it. You can whatever you want it to be, and then hit the enter button, and it'll change the name and instead of RPM2 or RPM1. And then as I uh, actually uh, run the prop up, I can see my RPMs registering in real time on the display as well. And then we can go ahead and look at our uh, temperature sensor. Temp, you have, uh, I have five of them hooked up right now. I went ahead and renamed those for what they're connected to, the motor, the ESC, the battery, ambient temperature, and of course the outlet. The outlet is something that I use, uh, the outlet on the fuselage, like you'll have air outlets. You have cold air coming in or ambient air coming in and then it, it runs across the ESC and electric power plant and all the components and then spits out the back of the fuselage. Monitoring that outlet air temperature tells me how much of a difference between ambient and outlet that it's actually extracting from any of the devices inside the fuselage. So it's kind of a good way to see what kind of ventilation and cooling you've got. Um, uh, you can change from, from imperial to metric here, or Celsius now, or back to Fahrenheit. You can um, reset those maxes. They have a max, average, and min for whatever you have selected. So post-flight, you can say, all right, how hot did my ESC run? How warm did my battery get? What were the ambient temperatures? My motor, how hot did it get as it went through the, through the uh, process or through the run? We'll back out to a battery. Now, battery is a great area. We've got the voltage uh, sensor and also the current sensor tied into this. So we're going to have a few more options than if we just, uh, went, when we just went with uh, the standard uh, voltage through the SPC port or just the receiver voltage. 
Uh, receiver voltage right now coming from the BEC is 5 volts. Uh, you can set a warning on that as well, so you can drop that or raise it up uh, depending on when you want to trigger it. You know, it's not a bad idea to have it trigger about 4.6, 4.7 volts or even 4.5 volts if you're running a 5 volt system because the lower that receiver voltage gets, re receiver voltage gets the higher probability of a brownout on your actual receiver on your radio system. You don't want that, so you want to be alerted if you're your servos are drawing so much that you're dropping the voltage down, or if there's a problem from your BEC as well. If I raise that up to clear to near five volts, you'll hear the alert. And that's what you would hear during flight if it got down to that. And it, it'll stop, it'll turn off as it, as it dips down into that voltage and back out. It has a max and min as well that you can reset. There's a second page on the uh, uh, battery section. I have our voltage center, pl center sensor plugged in, so our current voltage is 11.9 volts. Now this is tied into the main pack supply, so I have a 3S LiPo right now, it's running at 11.9 volts. I can set that warning as well. And I want to set my warning for my voltage sensor for my main flight pack above where my uh, low voltage cutoff, if I have that on the aircraft I'm flying. Now if I'm in a helicopter, I'm probably not using LVC, it's just going to run down and, and, and risk running the battery too low. So in that case I would run it down to you know, I know on a 3S battery, it's uh, 3 volts per cell, so 9 is when damage starts occurring when you start dropping below 9 volts. So I may say, all right, at 9.5 volts or 9.7 volts, warn me. Now, on an 11.1 volt pack, you're going to see a performance sag before you get to 9.7 volts, so you'll see a performance difference. But if you don't, you're still going to get warned by the radio system. So, again, raise it up above where it's at right now, and we'll get an alert. Something kind of cool, too, is if I leave it at 11.8 and I start running that motor up, you see what happens. As I, as I draw current and my voltage drops from my power supply, it's dipping down into that low voltage. And that's really how you, how you run it when you're flying with it. Um, as you start depleting the pack, you'll get these, it'll dip in and out of tone. And you're like, well, I'm getting, starting to get a little bit of a warning. So I know that I'm starting to push my pack to where I, I want to stop it from, uh, uh, from cutting off. So at least it gives you some time to come, you know, one or two passes until you get a good landing in. Uh, you can reset the maximum in as well. You can call that after the fact, um, as long as your radio system's still on. Uh, the current is our current sensor. We have a, a, the C50, 50, 50 amp current sensor in there. Let me go back a screen and turn that off. It's gonna be too low now. We'll drop that back down. So as I run this up, you'll see our current increase. And now since I have the voltage and the current installed, I get real-time wattage consumption. So right now this thing freewheeling with a very tiny prop on it is only pulling about seven watts, five, seven watts. Um, we do have a warning, uh, a high, it's set to off right now, but we can set the warning to uh, what we want it to be. So if we've got a 40 amp ESC, we don't want to be climbing into the 40 amp range. So we would drive that thing all the way up to about 39 amps. So we know that, um, we're running with uh, we're running uh, right up to the headroom on our ESC, and before we run into any sort of problems, you know, we could we could get a warning from the radio system. So there's a lot of different ways you can take advantage of this to monitor the systems and the performance. Uh, we'll go ahead and go back out. We'll go from the battery room to the cockpit. Now there's there's we'll jump into Servo Manager first. Uh, the cockpit and Easy View are two different ways for you to see multiple displays at once. So we'll go into Servo Manager's menu. I do have the Servo Manager connected. I have a single servo on the system. It's not connected to anything, so it's just freewheeling over there, and it's a, a relatively low-torque servo. So it's only drawing about almost like 0.6 amps, so just over a half amp it's drawing uh, right now, just going left and right on it. Now, if I, had, um, uh, uh, if I have a you know, high draw, it's starting to accumulate across each one of these. As I select the different ones, I only have uh, an active servo on one of them. As I select the different ones and I start accumulating, totaling up my amperage draw, that's where you can start budgeting your, your battery uh, eliminator circuit and make sure that you've got enough amperage available to the radio system to where, again, you don't cause a brownout situation where you uh, underpower your radio system by too much amperage draw or you run too hot on your uh, BEC and it kicks out uh, due to safety or overheat. So you can rename those. If you go in, you can choose uh, whatever you want to call it. I just called that one Aileron 1. I can go through and rename SV2 to whatever I want it to be and so on. Just hit enter after you've entered in the information. Um, it does have the max on each one of those listed as I go through them. So we'll back out of Servo Manager and we'll go into those two. Uh, we do have Advanced. Now Advanced is kind of cool. Uh, altitude, GPS, GPS and, or Variometer and GPS uh, is, are the two different options. Speed is GPS and airspeed sensor. GPS alone, airspeed sensor alone. So it, our GPS is going to give us ground speed. Our air sensor is going to give us indicated airspeed. Two very different things. Uh, aircraft require 
airspeed, indicated airspeed, air across the wings or under the wings to be able to fly. Whereas, you know, if you're going upwind or downwind rather, you may have some phenomenal ground speed uh, going on. You could be clocking along at 35, 40 miles an hour. But if you're in 15 mile an hour winds, now you have to subtract that and you don't have a sufficient uh, air over the wings or under the wings to fly. So I always run with my airspeed if I have airspeed enabled on it because I want to know what's actually coming across the, uh, uh, coming across the wings. So now if I wanted to do some, some high speed runs and actually track how fast it was going through the air relative to the ground, I'd switch over to my GPS and that would give me my downwind runs of, you know, I broke 150 miles an hour or whatever. So um, you do have that option. We go back and now we look at our cockpit and easy view. Cockpit is a, a summary of everything on a couple of pages. So you can see it gets pretty busy pretty quick. Um, motor RPM, or the, the two RPM sensors, GPS uh, airspeed, so GPS and airspeed, it'll show both of those combined um, based on the setting I have. GPS altimeter, uh, motor ESC battery, ambient and outlet, my five uh, temperature sensors that I have on there. If I go to the next page, I'll see my, uh, my servo manager showing all four of my servos. I also have my voltage, my amperage, and my wattage calculated real time on the screen. So as I go through and run things, it'll calculate. As I go back, I've got my motor RPM running now, and um, see my ESC temperature will start creeping up as I use that motor more and more. So that's the um, cockpit view. The easy view is nice because it does big letters or big numbers for everything, so you can glance at it easier when you're in the air. There's nine different pages of that based on what I have plugged in. Speed and altitude uh, does show max. Uh, you can reset that max. Uh, altitude, airspeed, variometer. Voltage, current, wattage, again calculated real time. And I can reset that max when I set a new max on each one of these. It'll currently show whatever I'm calculating. So now our maxes go up. So you got a quick interface there. Keep going on. We have motor, uh, RPM1 and RPM2. I don't have anything up to, up to RPM2, but our RPM1 will show. And then we can go back over to uh, aileron, uh, it's a servo manager. I have aileron one set up right there. Again, we can reset that max. And it'll set a new max, all you can recall after the flight. Second bank of servo managers, uh, ports, uh, temperature, motor ESC, battery ambient, and outlet. Um, again, these can all be renamed back in the previous screen uh, in, inside of each of the uh, uh, temperature sensors uh, uh, input uh, information. You can go through and change out the name if you want to. And it shows max as well. So that's the two different ways you really want to view the stuff from the, from the most part on the Aurora 9. It's going to give you a quick recall. Moving forward on the rest of, of what we have uh, at our disposal on the telemetry side is we also have um, a few different ways we can view the data. With all this data coming in and viewable on the Aurora 9, we can also tap into the data port on the back of the spectrum module and start using outboard devices, be it our HTS voice, our HTS iView module, and also then the, the Aurora 9 will, uh, uh, will piggyback everything back through the um, HTS Navi and dump it into our PC so we can take a look at the PC view of everything. So let's start by looking at the iView since it requires that data connection as well. We're going to go ahead and plug in a cable. And this, on the HPP22 clinic, we talked about these cables um, that are available. It's actually a female to female. It's going to ship. You're going to have one shipped with your iView. You're going to have one shipped with most of the products that need it. So, um, power on the uh, transmitter, power on the receiver with the telemetry station on board, and then plug in your HTS iView module. Follow this order of operations, and you'll find it works quite well. Um, we have an iPad here, iPad mini, that has a new lightning port on it as opposed to the 30-pin. You notice that the iView module actually is a 30-pin connector, which works great on the uh, iPhone 4, 4S, and, and previous versions. But uh, when you go to the, to the new products like the iPhone 5 and, of course, the iPad and iPad mini, um, you have the lightning port. The adapter works just fine. If we uh, go ahead and plug in the adapter... We'll see the blue light flash, and then as we launch the software, what you're going to get is a consistent blue light flashing. We'll launch the I HTS iView, and you can go out and find this on the Apple uh, Store. It's HTS-iView, and you'll be able to find it. It says that it's successfully linked, and now we have a consistent blue flashing icon. So anything we see or anything we do on the model is going to show up here. Our speed is reporting again because we're indoors from outdoors. It's, it's the satellite, the GPS isn't getting a signal. As we go through and start running up our motor, we'll notice our RPM will start showing up. 
and these are by uh, uh, 10,000, so we're at 10,000 RPM roughly right there. If you had a second RPM sensor, it would show up as well. Our temperatures are displayed across the front as well, and this is the main view. Altitude zero feet, again, trip and current. Our um, current sensing is, is done real time as well, but uh, our GPS data isn't coming through at all since we're not uh, using this outdoors. So, and we also have our volt from our main pack, 11.9, 11.8 volts, and then we have our receiver battery, which is our BEC feed at uh, 5.0 volts. Now we can go into another level. This we can record what's taking place generally. We can also go into detail and say, all right, here's our GPS signal. I've got a 50% signal here, um, which isn't that's generous because I'm not getting good uh, a good lock in. Uh, we can take a look at our RPM. And there's another, another indication, another way to look at our RPM. So depending on what you want to see out in the field, it'll start updating that. It'll track that RPM as it changes. We can also go back here and look at temperature. And there's our four temperature sensors, reading those in real time. We also have fuel. I don't have any fuel in the fuel tank. We do have a fuel sensor on there, so it would indicate our fuel level. And then current voltage. So receiver batteries at 5 volts. The main pack voltage is 11.9 volts. No current or wattage being consumed other than just some transient uh, readings. As we kick in and start consuming, it's going gonna, it's gonna to calculate in real time based on the voltage and the current what our wattage consumption is. So we're choosing uh, or we're, we're drawing about 7, 8 watts and uh, about 10 watts now power. So that's the detail view. As far as the, uh, the uh, Measurement, unit of measurement, you can go to setup and um, you can choose the uh, units here, metric or imperial. You can also go back to RPM and you can choose the range. So you can actually custom uh, lay out the, the range of the actual uh, RPM uh, that you're seeing. Now, if you're picking off of a prop, if you've actually got the, uh, if you're doing optical RPM sensing, you're going to want to choose how many blade prop you have or uh, rotor blades, of course, two or a four-bladed rotor, something like that. You're going to want to choose that because it's going to be doing the vision of the uh, actual times. It, it, it gets interrupted, the image gets interrupted, the light does. So you'll want to choose the right prop if you're going off of that. I'm going right off the barrel of my motor, so it really doesn't matter. I just leave it on two on everything, so it's a, you know, it's a, it's a true uh, reading from the, optical RP, or from the magnetic RPM. This applies to your optical RPM. Uh, you, again, you can set uh, red zone and also range on that as well for your RPMs. Temperature, you can go through and name them here. So you can have custom names on the uh, HDSI view interface. And then you can also uh, choose the red zone uh, where the uh, critical zones are. Current voltage, receiver battery. Um, and we can choose what the actual receiver battery is. We can customize it. Uh, if we were running a, a, a lithium iron phosphate, we could choose the 6.6 uh, .6 volts as our uh, receiver battery. And uh, then we're going to look at the actual... Um, uh, voice, the HTS voice, we can go through and turn on warnings for RPM 1, 2, 10, 1 through 4, and also our current and electrical information. So um, when we look at uh, the one more feature that's on here is map. If we actually had the GPS registering outdoors, we'd be able to uh, take advantage of the fact that it knows where we're at right now with it not knowing where we're at other than our last location. Uh, it does show uh, the display. In fact, when I did it uh, I did the test layout, it picked the, uh, the plane up right in my driveway. So it saw the plane actually sitting there in the driveway because I had information or those stuff sitting out uh, on some stands in the garage. So you can actually look at where you've been where in, and what took place in the flight from this map view, which is a really neat feature. So you can kind of get an idea of where all you flew. A lot of times you think you're a lot closer in than you were. In fact, you're a lot further out. So if you, cli if you fly by any obstructions like roadways or walk paths or something like that, this is a good way to verify that you're flying within a safe area. Um, and, uh, and do so after the flight. So main goes back to our, our display. Again, this works on uh, multiple devices. iOS works fine with the Lightning, the 30-pin adapter. That's the HTS iView software. We'll go ahead and continue next and take a look at the HTS Navi interface on the PC. All right, you'll want to watch the HPP22 clinic that we did on, on uh, use and download and everything else of the HPP22 software. We're going to go ahead and launch it, and uh, then what we're going to do is plug in our our Navi, we can even do this. We're going to go to the High Tech Telemetry System Command Center since we're going to have our telemetry functions there. As you notice, we can go into our demo mode, as we mentioned in the clinic, and take a look at what a display looks like. Um, there's the Nitro display and all the good stuff there. Um, we're going to go ahead and, and do this real time. So let's go ahead and go back. And then we're going to plug in the HTS Navi. And our first step is we need to bind or link the HTS Navi to our transmitter. So let's go ahead and kill the transmitter. Now that the HDS Navi is plugged in, we do have the option to go into it and choose some of the options. So we're going to choose Link. 
and then click on the icon. And it's going to give us some instructions. We press and hold the link button on the HTS Navi until the uh, blue light goes out. Hit next. And now it's in link mode. There we go. The blue light's out. We've got the red, red uh, light only. We can let off the uh, link button. And now it's ready to take the link signal from the transmitter. So we choose next. And we press and hold the link button on the Spectre 2.4 gig module and uh, then turn on the radio system and choose uh, yes for transmit. So we're going to go ahead and plug in or push in on the link button on the back of the Spectre module, turn it on, and we're going to choose yes for transmit. And then you can release the button at that point. So now we look at the module and it's flashing blue. In some cases it's flashing red. All you do is press down the link button to hold it for a couple seconds. It'll switch over to blue. You want the Spectre module flashing blue. And you also want this, the blue LED flashing on the module itself. We'll click next on that. And it's red LED blue and everything looks good there. So we're going to go next. And now it's linked. So what you're going to want to do though is after it's linked is uh, go ahead and kill the software, unplug the HTS Navi, plug it back in, turn off your receiver or transmitter as well. That way everything gets fresh. After you ever link two devices, you always want to power them down and back up. So they're out of that link mode. We'll launch HTTP 22 again. We'll go into High Tech Telemetry System uh, Center. And now uh, we're back up and we have the HTS Navi plugged in, so it's an option. Keep in mind, though, and we'll show this, at this time, only the Nitro Display and, and the uh, Blue for Electric Displays, or HTSS uh, uh, modules, are, are configured to work with the uh, HPP22 software. Down the road, uh, we will be able to um, activate also the HTSS Advanced. It's just so new that the software hasn't been released for it. But this is where we can actually upgrade the uh, HTS Navi as well. We can say um, uh, Upgrade. It's going to go through, look at it, look at the upgrade function. It's going to look at the current version, version 1.02. We can say Upgrade if you want to. And we'll select the version, and 1.02 is the current one. So if, if we want to need to update it, we could click on that, click yes, and go through and update our software on our, our firmware on our HTS Navi. So we're going to go ahead and back out of this, and back out, and now we're back at the main screen. So let's go ahead and switch over to a radio system with our um, uh, HTSS Nitro sensor station on board, and we'll take a look at how that how that appears in the software. Okay, we've got our uh, Optic 6 Sport now linked to the HTS Navi. We just followed the same procedures we did with the Aurora 9. And um, we've got an HTSS for Nitro sensor station, the Optima 9 receiver, and uh, just a couple of sensors. We have a couple of temperature sensors wired in just so we have some data to work with. So uh, I was doing a bunch of different things here. Let me go ahead and exit out. We'll go ahead and relaunch it just to make sure we don't have anything confused. And we're going to go into our high tech telemetry system software. We're going to select our target as HTSS Nitro, and then choose the uh, HTS Navi. That's going to ask us, connect sensor data display. We're going to say yes. Go ahead and display the sensor data. And there it is. So we've got our two, uh, all we have is our two temperature sensors on here right now uh, that are plugged in. But as you see, it will immediately start climbing up as uh, I start and then going into the red zone, we had a, a threshold set at a fairly low temperature. So we've got all our data display, which is kind of cool. Depending on the sensor station you choose, it'll, it'll kind of determine which uh, sensor information is displayed on the screen. There are a couple things you want to be aware of. Uh, for example, uh, we can also we can go into to, uh, our setup. I didn't hit it. And we can go through and choose if we want imperial or metric on, on all of our uh, measurements. We can also go through and set up like our temperature uh, warnings, our range. We can even determine the range. Even though it goes minus 40 to 392 degrees Fahrenheit, we can set that to a shorter range so we don't have all these, uh, you know, it's, it's, it shows pretty small when you get a 20 degree variance down here. But if we take the, we've take the, uh, all the temperatures and uh, we make it to, uh, we know we're not going to be flying in minus 40. So we go through and we say, let's go ahead and make that, um, you know, 50 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, and then we take this to, uh, let's say, uh, we'll go 130 degrees. And that's what we're going to stick with on that. So uh, down here on the red zone, uh, you know, where does it become critical? Uh, let's say if it gets to, oh, I don't know, we'll make it... Uh, 100 degrees, we want to know. So at 100 degrees, we've now got um, 
50 to 130 and 100 degrees. Now I can just set that for the first one, which is what I was on, or I can set that for all of them. I say all change, I go ahead and say all change, and it's going to change my range now from my 50 to 130 degrees. So I've got a little better granularity on the uh, display I'm looking for. So same thing with the uh, with, uh, range, the, uh, or the RPM range, and also you can set up the gear ratio if you wanted to calculate based on optical RPM what you're dealing with there for, for those. So now we've got a little better granularity. We're down here at 63, 64 degrees, 50 degrees Fahrenheit on, uh, on the other uh, sensors itself. So that's, uh, that's how you adjust the actual setup of itself. You can record and play back as well. You can also go into um, uh, the display, and this is where we can do our 3D display. For example, if we wanted vector information on all our GPS data coming back to us, it would do it. And this is a pretty efficient way to do it. It'll show you where you're at, your lat lawn, your altitude, everything else. Uh, we can go ahead and also uh, view on the display 3D Google Earth. So you can actually see your aircraft represented on a 3D Google Earth map based on lat and lawn data where it went and uh, what its activity was throughout the course of the flight, either real time or after the flight's completed. So it's a pretty neat, uh, pretty neat interface. It's a nice little way to see it, nice graphical way to see it. It's also a nice way to store and recall the information, much like the HGSI view. But this gives you a little bigger format to work with, and those files are portable then. You can save those, those uh, log files and uh, play them back at a later date. So that's the HTS, uh, um, uh, HTS Navi using the HPP22 software. Again, there's a clinic out there for the HPP22. It'll give you full information as to how to download everything. Now, something else we'll do through the HPP22 software is we'll update the HTS Voice firmware, and we can also uh, adjust the settings on the HTS Voice. In order to tap into the HTS Voice, we're going to go ahead and, um, and access it through the HPP22 module. So we'll go ahead and pull that back out. Here's the module. We'll connect our USB cable. And make sure that that's active and ready to go. We can go ahead and set our telemetry stuff off to the side here. And the HTS voice we have attached to the Aurora 9. Now to actually tap the data into the radio system, we're going to need one of the data cables. We'll go ahead and use it first to access the HPP22 for the setup. So by default, the, uh, the uh, HTS voice has pretty much everything turned on, which is, it's, you'd find out really quickly would be annoying. Uh, the HTS voice itself, actually, if you just hold down the multifunction button, it'll turn the unit on. It'll announce it's being turned on. Power on. Custom setting mode. And you, can, and you can go through. I'll go ahead and turn it back off for now. Power off. You can go ahead and through and choose your function by rotating that wheel forward and backward. But we're going to tap into the HPP22 module here, and uh, we're going to do a firmware update or excuse me, a uh, setup. We've already covered the firmware update uh, procedures in, in uh, another clinic. So we're going to take a look at the HTS voice. Since the HP22 is plugged in, I have both of these options available to me. We're going to say HTS voice. We're going to go ahead and do setup, and that's the key thing. So we click on the icon then, and it's going to say plug in to P1 off the HP22. It's flashing, which means it's ready. And it's going to tell us to plug into the data port up on the voice and then turn the unit on. So we'll press that button down. I'll turn it so you can see the LED. And then once the unit's on, it'll go through and read it. Now the neat thing about this is you've got, um, you, ha you can totally customize what's being said back to you on the HTS voice. Again, you can use a earbud, and I highly recommend it if you're flying with a group. It gets pretty annoying pretty quickly, and I can speak from personal experience having somebody beside me with one of these things chattering away every 30 seconds or 10 seconds about their levels. It just it starts messing with your head. You start thinking it's your, your battery levels and stuff. But So the earbuds are definitely a, a courtesy thing. Stick in some earphones and use that jack if you can. Um, mode selection, default mode, is to where everything chatters. Uh, and and it, everything, all of the uh, uh, warning uh, options or uh, sensor options are turned on. So I immediately go into custom mode. You can choose your measurement there, Imperial Metric. And then chattering, 10 second or 30 second. Chattering just chattering away. It just keeps cycling through all the different settings. 10 second is every 10 seconds it goes through and reports. 30 seconds every 30 seconds. I give it on 30 second. You can save it any time as you make changes. Click on save. It'll upload it to the HTS voice. It doesn't take long to drop everything up there. And then we can switch over to announcing on and off. So do you want anything announced? This is just, it'll, every 30 seconds it'll announce these things. Uh, some people like to just have maybe battery or maybe just engine temperature or maybe ESC temperature. It really depends on what your critical measurements are. 
Uh, but this is where you're going to choose the announcement. So every single 30 seconds, it's going to chat out whatever you've told to do. So I've got a random selection here turned on and off. Um, you can choose whatever you want to, whatever makes the most sense for your application. And of course, warning selection now. Um, it will announce warnings regardless of time interval. As soon as one of these warnings are met, it'll announce it out to you to let you know. So you can set your battery, uh, you can set your fuel level, you can set all the critical information, be it a temperature for the engine or for anything else, you can set all that up in there as well to be able to announce it um, at the time that, uh, as soon as one of those threshold, thresholds are met or, ex met or exceeded. So this is a really handy area, but you're gonna to wanna to go in before you use your HTS voice. You're gonna to wanna to pick up the HTTP 22, get in here and make all these uh, setting adjustments for what works for you. Depending on your ambient temperatures, sometimes you know, 100 degree variance between ambient temperature and motor temperature under a heavy run on electric motor power, power plant is not uncommon, but if you say, all right, that arbitrarily is then, you know, 290 degrees or 280 degrees, or, um, uh, excuse me, two, you know, 200 degrees, because the ambient temperature is, you know, 95 today, maybe it's, you know, it's another 100, 100 degrees, it's, it's 195. But then all of a sudden you're flying in a 50 degree day, you shouldn't be getting up to that temperature. So, um, you're really going to have to make those adjustments based on what your flying conditions are, what your local temperature is, your local weather, and also you know what you have things set up. Some power plants run hotter than others. So that's how you adjust all that stuff, and those are for the warnings. And it'll only tell you when these are reached. If you take announcements and you pretty much turn all these off, you just slide them to the off position, um, she's not going to be bugging you. The, uh, the invoice announcer isn't going to be chatting in your ear constantly. So we just turn everything off, and you won't hear a darn thing. Um, only when warnings come about. Which kind of is kind of a cool way to do it, you know. It's it's really I want to know when my battery gets low, so I don't have to listen to some arbitrary tone going off on my radio because I have different thresholds set up. So um, that's how you do that. Um, we'll go ahead and leave uh, a couple of announcements on, so you can hear what that's like. We'll turn this on and this and, and this one. We'll go ahead and do current level voltage level. So we'll go ahead and save that to the uh, module. It'll announce it out, and then we'll give you a sample of what the actual voice sounds like. Uh, when you're using it. So when you're using your HTS voice, you're going to plug it into the data, the data port on the back of your Spectrum module. Now in the HiTech or the Optic 6 Sport, you have the data port back here, which is the same thing, data port there and there. Same thing with the Eclipse 7, you'll see it a discrete data port. You're going to plug the module into that, make sure you get the polarity right, and you're going to route this cable around whatever makes sense. It's not going to cause any interference or problems at all. But now you've got your HTS voice hooked up to your uh, transmitter. So we kick it on and take a look uh, at our telemetry data. Oop, throttles up. There we go. Um, we can go ahead and go into our uh, sensor and take a look at our sensor data. You know, just uh, we'll just go into the cockpit view, make sure everything's still working over there. There we go. Everything's still functioning just fine. So now we've got data coming into our, our Aurora 9 or into our transmitter. And as soon as we turn on our voice module, and she's going to start talking to us. Hold down the power button until the blue light comes power. on. So there it is. She'll go through and do a report every 30 seconds based on what's set, what's set up. And I also heard an alert on initialization that my battery was too low. And that was based on the thresholds that I set in the uh, HPP22 software. And uh, you'll hear that little tone, the warning tone, and uh, it'll tell you that there's a problem. It'll announce what the problem is. And she instructed me to change the battery immediately. So hold down the power button and that'll turn it off. You'll get an acknowledgement, and that's it. That's how simple the HTS voice is. If you've already got telemetry built in and you've done all the configuration there on your radio system, um, just simply going through and setting it up in the HPP22 software is going to allow you to make the settings or, or make changes to it and, and make it useful for your application. So it's a, it's a benefit and not an annoyance out at the airfield. Well, that wraps up our three-part series on high-tech telemetry. If you'd like more information, including availability of sensors, sensor stations, module and accessories, as well as compatible radio systems, you can go to the high-tech website at hightechrcd.com. Thanks for watching, and good luck with your telemetry project.